Take us and make us yours. Amen. Jesus said, Whoever hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on a rock. What Jesus said in Matthew 5, the Sermon on the Mount, he thought it was reasonable and something that anyone could be doing. They were not, you know, simply giving, he was not simply giving information that would be on a test later. Nor was it some, some good religious ideas to have in your religious understanding of God. No, these words form a coherent life plan in which Jesus had full expectations that everyone who heard would then actually do. So let's try it out. Imagine your life right now. Your life where your anger, your grudges, your contempt, your sarcasm were no longer poisoning the relationships at home, in church, at work. It's not that you were trying real hard not to be angry. It just wasn't part of your, your makeup anymore. It wasn't part of your operating system of how you do life. Sounds quite ideal, yet impossible, right? Well, let's just keep going. Let's imagine your life where perverted sexual thoughts were no longer the rudder that turned your eyes. Your thoughts, your fantasies. Imagine how warm and satisfying your marriage would be without lust, anger, resentment, grudges. Sounds like a really good life. Jesus went on to many other topics than to complete a full life plan in the rest of the Sermon on the Mount, but today we just have chapter 5. And he ends this section with how we speak to one another with our words and the purpose of those words. So imagine that you no longer used your words to manipulate people to get what you wanted. But you simply let your yes be yes and your no, no. And if you didn't get what you wanted and, or people didn't think of you in the light that you were hoping, the positive light you were shooting for, it was just completely okay. I, I'm fine with it. Does this sound like a life that's even possible? Good, desirable, but yeah, it's not going to happen anytime soon, is it? At least not in your life or in my life because of our inner life that goes on there. Anger just comes easily and effortlessly to us. And lust is almost automatic, at least for us guys. And, you know, and, and marriage on a good day is hard. And, and then our words just flow so easily into trying to manage people's perception and to get what we want. It's just, it's just without thinking what we do. And yet, Jesus was very matter-of-fact, very emphatic that these would be the very words and the life that you would then do. It's like, wow! How is that going to be possible? Well, it won't be if you use these words of Jesus simply as good ideas. You will have no life change whatsoever as long as you simply think, well, that's a good idea. You, people should do that. People should try hard to do what Jesus is saying. Well, be careful how hard you try. Because these words will literally kill you. At the very least, you'll go blind or crippled. As the very necessary words then 
would require you to gouge out eyes and sever limbs. But if you honestly agreed that it would be better to roll into heaven a bloody stump than to be cast into hell completely whole, then this is how one tries hard. But these words of Jesus are not good ideas to strive for. They are not even rules or laws which are then to be obeyed. So please, put the knife down. Well, if they're not good ideas or laws, then what are they? They are teachings for life change from the master teacher who knows what he's doing. And since he knows how to teach, let us sit back and allow the teacher to teach. For he begins with the very fire that ignites most of the misery in the world, that causes most of the misery in your family and in your own soul. He begins with anger. And most of what is wrong and done wrong in the world by us begins with a heart that is mad, incensed. Ah! Anger, let's just be upfront about what it is. It's just an emotion. It is not sinful in and of itself. Anger is like happy or sad. Okay, but anger is the emotion that lets you know, hey, I didn't get my way. I didn't get what I wanted. And what you wanted may have been a very good thing, like justice, righteousness, mercy. May have been something like food. You know, you, you've been there. There's one cookie left, you know. And you were looking forward to it. And, you, and then when you open up the Tupperware, it was gone. Somebody left the Tupperware like where you keep the cookies, not next to the sink, you know. And, and then that's where trouble with anger begins. Because it, it, wasn't, it wasn't just that the cookie was missing. You, you ate the cookie. And it wasn't just a cookie or even the last cookie. It was my cookie. Anger quickly moves into contempt when we then discover who the person was and we then devalue that person. They are then placed in the lowest subgroup of humanity known as filth. You're no longer a person. You're a disgusting piece of filth. That's the reason when we feel contempt, our words go to the vulgar vocabularies. And this, this moving people into the vulgar category, well, they had to go from somewhere. And they were at a very high status as one created in the image of the living God with an inherent dignity of humanity. They were someone worthy of being loved as you love yourself. But once we have yanked them down, then we can yell at them, berate them, belittle them, we can abuse them, hate them, and even kill them. Because they're not human. Not human like we are. We move from anger, which is not sinful, to contempt, which is always sinful. It's all empowered by our pride. Our pride is offended. I didn't get what I wanted, and I can't stand it, and I'm going to do something about this. I will assault you with my words or my body, or by withdrawing from you. I'll tell you often and I never want to see you again. I'll never set foot in this place again. And then we don't. Mic drop.
you can see that if this fire of pride has this much power, if the, if the words of Jesus were simply good ideas to do, they'd be far too anemic, far too powerless to check our pride because I can have a really good idea that to hurt you is bad and still do it. They're not even rules or commands from God. Even they do not have the power to override our pride and check it. Because there's just something about us when we're told what to do, oh, it, it, it erupts a riot of rebellion within our hearts and we say, oh, yes, I will. See, Jesus is the master teacher and he knows the human heart. He knows how to teach the human heart. He knows that our pride will not be reformed by uh, laws or rules. He knows that we will not be, our pride will not be redirected by a good idea. Here, let's just do this. Like a small child, you can, here, we'll do this. No, Jesus knows that our pride must die. And that's where the very ominous and scary words of Jesus begin to make sense and they become very instructive. Where he says, whoever would follow after me, and that's us, right? We're, we're his followers. Must deny themselves. That's going after your pride. And what, do you, what is he going to do with it? Whoever would follow after me must deny themselves and pick up their cross and follow. That's death. But how can our pride die and we not be lost in the process? Well, Jesus knows how to do it. He knows how to take us into death, real death, His death. And there we die to ourselves. And as He takes us into His death, He also takes us into His life. And perhaps now you can see the power and the purpose of your baptism where you truly died with Jesus. You were brought into his death and you were brought into his resurrection. And what dies, it truly is ourself, but it is also our pride. It is no longer now our master. For now it's still there, but it's not your master anymore. You now have Jesus and you have the Holy Spirit residing in you. See, that's what is given in baptism. Death and life and now the Spirit. And this is where the real change of heart and life comes from. As the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit takes up residence in you, there your heart is receiving what its soul has first longed for and demanded and what set the pride on fire is that I must have love and respect and honor and value and worth and delight and mercy and all of that is now being given to your heart by the indwelling presence of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. What we tried to fill with cookies and the delight and lust of our eyes, with, with the, the demand that our spouse must make us happy with the manipulation of our words to get what we want, is now being freely and given to us by Jesus, and He sets our hearts at rest. I truly am loved and His. I'm now able to see you as a human being created in the image of God, worthy of being loved like I now am loved. Even if you cross my pride, even if you stop me from getting what I want, even if you cause some great injustice to me, I still can hold you at the same status of a human being. And in those places, my heart is, and your heart is not at rest. The places 
of anger and contempt where your heart is not tender towards other people, where there is lust and where there is a hardness and, and a discontentment in marriage and a manipulation of words. Those are the very places that God is calling you out. Not to admonish you, not to, to tell you to get your act together and try harder. Instead, He's calling you out to call you closer to Himself where His grace and His power and His leading truly will change and transform your heart into a very different kind of person. So think about this. If Jesus the teacher is living in you, he's, he's available 24-7, right? And then his word becomes extremely important because the Holy Spirit is using the teachings of Jesus as the direction, as what your life now will look like, and the power then to do it. So to take these teachings of Jesus out and to actually engage them into, into your regular life, two things will be very important. How you think about yourself and how you think about other people. This inner world that God is in and is changing and is empowering to have before your mind how God thinks of you, that you are His Holy, beloved, blood bought on the cross child. And so your prayer then to Jesus is to ask him to keep before your mind the way he thinks about you would be the way you think about you. And so you ask Jesus that I would think of myself as your chosen, your holy one, your beloved one all because of your grace. And then how you think about other people, it becomes very crucial. That you think of them as the high status of humanity that they are. That you, they're worthy of your love as you love yourself. And that, Jesus, you would keep that before my mind. This, then, is the life that Jesus knows is reasonable and that you can do. For he is the one enabling and in empowering you to do it. To him alone be the glory, power, and honor. Amen. A sermon take-home card is available for you on...